Hi, this is Esan. Here in this lab, number 12, I'm going to discuss about the role of memory in motor control and learning. In this video, we are only going to talk or discuss about memory while providing some key definitions. So the first idea is why do we even need to think about memory? Well, at every moment we are bombarded with information. These informations are collected from various sensors and we use them to generate short-term responses. Now, if you think a little more closely, these responses are not always completely based on the perceived, received, or filtered information. Informally speaking, sometimes our responses require us to use our past experiences. Now, if we consider our past experiences to be an information, we can intuitively understand that we need to retrieve this information from somewhere, precisely speaking, from some part of our brain. Moreover, we also need to save our present experience. So the natural questions that might follow are, in what forms are these memories stored? How do we even store or retrieve this memory? Most importantly, how does this entire system work? Before trying to find any of these answers, let us try to define memory. Informally speaking, we refer to memory as retention or the capacity to remember. However, Dr. Chalving provides a more holistic definition and defines memory to be the capacity that permits the organism to benefit from past experiences. This definition of memory can be related to both verbal and motor memory. However, the little customized, precise, yet intuitive definition of motor memory is given by Schmitz and Lee. They state that motor memory can be defined as the persistence of the acquired capability for motor performance. The existence of such motor memory is also highlighted in theories of motor control and learning, as depicted in the motor program theory and the schema theory. Now, now that we have a definition, let us also try to find a basis for memory from the perspective of neurophysiology. But before we dive into the world of neurons, let us briefly look into human brain to see how different sections of the brain relate to different memories. According to researchers, you can actually blame your temporal lobe for long-term memories that you have trouble with, or that, have, that has troubled you. Moreover, memories related to spatial position is embedded in the hippocampus. So informally speaking, the cells in the hippocampus can be associated uh, well, a cell, a certain cell in the hippocampus can be associated with a certain position in the physical world or space around you. However, this is just a, just an informal idea. The question that you might ask is how in the world do we find or associate our some organ in the brain with some memory or some other things? Well, one example, one informal example can be let us train 10 mice to do a certain series of movement to get food. The series of movements are same. Let's consider this situation. And we train them for a year to do the same thing. Now, 10 researchers take all these 10 mice individually and they zap different part of the brain and see how they react, whether they can go to the food. So. If they see that the temporal, when zapping the temporal lobe, they see that they cannot find the food anymore. In that case, they can consider this to be a, a related to long-term memory, just to give you an idea. Okay. Now let us move on to the neurophysiological basis behind memory. According to researchers, the formation of memories can be associated with the pattern of group of neurons firing together. For example, Imagine these three neurons, they were not directly related to start with. They were isolated and not really connected. The dot, dotted lines means weak initial connections. Now, due to subactivity, which can be verbal or motor, the neurons starts to fire in a certain pattern. Now, the person doing the activity, if he does activity more and more, they fight. Uh, so they fire like having a similar pattern more and more. Our brains are smart. They can learn such patterns. 
And when the learning is done, the next time they see a similar firing pattern, our responses becomes faster. This can be related to plasticity of our brains as well. So the implications are every perceived sensation creates neural connections. However, there is a time factor associated with this. So if this sensation is not practiced, the memory would fade. A, mem a fading of a memory would mean the neural connections are lost. Moreover, in principle, if same neural network is lit up, it should give rise to the same thought. <sighs> However, this is not always the case, as sometimes similar mutated pattern occurs. For example, if you know how to play table tennis, if you try to play tennis for the first time with your given skills, you might try to hit the ball similarly, as you would have done for table tennis. And with practice, you learn to adapt. And the patterns are somehow mutated. And they also create some kind of association with other neural networks. Just to give you an idea. Finally, um, yeah, so basically that's the idea of neural basis of memory. So after listening till now, you might want to ask whether verbal or motor memory is considered part of the same memory system. The answer is not so straightforward. Although some researchers consider them to be part of the same system, but there are two conditions which suggest they're not. One of them is apraxia, the other is agnosia. The person is told to do similar things. However, sometimes based on the problem, they cannot produce the movement from verbal command or sometimes even if they can produce the movement, they cannot name it. So this gives an intuitive idea that they might not be similar. Now, before finishing this segment of the memory lecture, let us look into some key definitions and memory measurement techniques. Let's start with retention. Retention can be defined as the process of remembering information. In contrast, forgetting, although, means the process of not being able to remember, but does not necessarily imply that memory is not there. Maybe, for some reason, you just cannot retrieve it. Retrieval, on the other hand, is the process of calling up memory from long-term, calling up information from long-term memory. Sometimes it is defined in terms of short-term memory as well. So, how would you measure memory? The first thing is, I would say, recall test. The example can be the final test where you'll be asked to produce, reproduce some key ideas from Kinesis 385. This is an example of recall test. Maybe you, we ask you to explain the neurophysiological basis of memory. Whereas, the multiple choice question that you will have to answer for this lab is recognition tests. Okay, this is the end of this section, segment for memory. Later, we are going to discuss about two major memory components, one short-term memory, the other long-term memory. Bye.